So today we're diving into the world of tech, entrepreneurship, and venture capital with a truly exceptional guest, Joy Randall. She is a trailblazer who's not only shattered glass ceilings, but also built and scaled companies from the ground up. From launching her first venture at 17 to playing a pivotal role in companies like Apple and Akamai, Joy has not only just broken the grass, glass ceiling, she's reshaped the skyline with over $360 million raised and $15 billion in revenue generated. Her impact is undeniable. Joy's journey is nothing short of inspirational. She's a speaker, author, and a beacon for diversity in tech. Let's explore the mind and methods of a woman who's not just part of the industry, but is actively defining its future. Welcome, Joy. Thank you so much for making wow. the time to, to hop on this, uh, this interview. Hey, I'm excited. And what an intro. Like nobody's ever given me an intro like that before. That's amazing. <laughs> I love to hear it. I love to hear it. So Joy, you you launched your first venture at 17. What was your like childhood like that it inspired you to step into the entrepreneurial world so early? And what were like the key lessons from those initial experiences? Well, actually, I started my first company earlier than that, believe it or not. So I started selling door to door when I was nine. I don't think I, my parents used to say I never met any strangers, but I started my first company when I was actually uh, 14. And um, it was really, I had a passion for graphic design. And back then you could actually make more than two cents doing graphic design, which you can't now. Um, so I started a company doing that. And um, it was what was my minor when I went to college as well. But I was doing things like, uh, corporate brochures and and a whole bunch of different things along that line. And um, it was fun. It got me, actually, what got me interested in doing it was I was the, um, I worked on the annual staff, right, in high school, right, in, in middle school. And so um, I was like, wow, this stuff's really cool. And I get to do this. I wonder if I could get any money for doing this so that I'm not doing babysitting or working at, you know, McDonald's. And it turns out you can. Um, so I started that company. I ended up, um, selling that company later before I went away to school. And it's funny that our whole thing that spawned this, right, was my comment about companies being worth something or not worth something, right? So that was one of those companies where you're basically selling the assets. So what they were buying from me was my customers, right? They weren't buying anything that was, I mean, you're not bringing me along with it. And so that was the value that that had, which is a very small value. But, you know, when you're going away to college, any value is good, right, at the end of the day. Um, so it was, um, it was interesting. And I ended up starting another company doing similar things when I was in college as well. That's interesting. That's interesting. And what, what, how did you get the idea of like, all right, I could sell this thing. Um, I, you know, I, I had somebody just make the offer. So I didn't really think about it at the point in time, but I had, um, a company that, um, I had beat ironically on a bid to do something and they offered to buy it. So the guy who owned the company just called me up and he's like, hey, you know, um, I understand you're going away to school soon. I guess one of the customers told him. And mm -hmm. uh, he goes, you know, do you want to sell it? I said, well, I never really thought about selling it, you know, but I was like, yeah, okay. What does that mean? Right. <laughs> and um, so that was a very simple transaction because it was just me. I'm a kid. Right. I mean, really. Um, at the end of the day, my mom had run a beauty salon. So my mother had had a, a salon for years. So it wasn't like, I didn't understand what it was like to be around somebody doing business at, at the end of the day. And even after my mom sold the salon, she had like always had some side hustle. It was just kind of the the thing. Right. So we're used to, used to that kind of thing, but, um, I didn't get a ton of money for it. I mean, I got about a year's revenue for it, which was a lot of money to me at the time, but not in reality. I, I certainly wouldn't consider that a success today if you sold the company for 1x revenue. Um, but when you're, you know, at the time, I mean, 17 years old, I was going to college, I went to college half a day, went to high school half a day for um, the time I was in high school. So I could split my time. So when I left to go away to school, I already had an associate's degree when I left to go to school at UGA. So that was like the beginning of your like huge track record of successful acquisitions and IPOs. So like, what would you say 
are like your core principles for building high value, scalable businesses? Like how would you identify the potential in a venture? Um, you know, due diligence is a weird process, right? And due diligence for making an investment is typically different than due diligence for an acquisition. Um, at the end of the day, I kind of look at it, you, you have, if you're making an investment, if you're making an early stage investment, you're betting on the person more than you are anything else, right? Because what I really want to know is, does that person care about what they're doing and can they execute? Um, and execution and perseverance actually matter way more than the idea does at the end of the day. Now, I made a decision that I won't do any investments that don't have at least one female that has um, a significant amount of equity in the company. And I made that decision. There's a group of us, a group called All Race that focus on investing in women founders. But I did it because we don't see as many ideas from women that are big ideas. And I know that sounds bad, but it's just the truth, right? Guys tend to, I don't see a lot of women who have a dream like Elon Musk. And we need to change that. And so I, I believe the only way we can change that is to make women believe that they can do more, be more. And they need to see some examples. So when you see an example of someone who is really looking to build something that's going to create real change, then you want to support that. Um, there's a company out of San Francisco called Hold Harvest. As it turns out, the woman who runs it, Christine Mosley, um, she, I met her through her mom. Her mom's in a women's group that, that I'm in they actually do a second harvest of crops. And those go to like restaurants, places like that. They don't care how pretty the food is. They care that it's quality organic food out there. She's done amazingly well. And so it's things like that that you see where somebody's creating real sustainable change in our world and they understand business, they can execute, they have the drive and the passion behind it. Those are the things I would look for when you start Going beyond that, right, where you're investing a little, a little bit later in the in the stage of the company, or it's an M&A, then you look at tangible and intangible assets besides just the founders. So if I had um, a tech business, I may want to retain some of the talent. So are there talent that I want to retain? And I should use tech as an example. Um, or do I want to build a business? Let's say I'm building a, um, I don't know, I've got a HVAC business. Those are highly profitable. Um, you know, and so I'm building this business in that scenario. I think you want to make it where, you know, that you can walk away, meaning the business can operate without you. So you have to have those systems and things in place so that the company that buys you can keep you for a period of time to do that transition. But then the business is going to continue to grow after you're gone. So there's a couple of different ways of thinking about it, right? Like if you're a company that has a lot of IP and you want to protect your IP and have they done the right things to do that, um, and that can be, I, I find people think they have to have a patent, which is not really true. Um, you know, you can do things like have a, a good trade secret policy where you can write things up. We, with Velocity, the company we sold to Akamai, um, we didn't have any patents, but we had a killer trade secret policy. Um, and it made a huge difference in the acquisition price of the company because we basically said to them, we said, well, we're not going to tell you any more than what you can see here on the outside about what the tech is, what we've built until we have agreed to a price. And once we've agreed to a price, then we'll do that. And the reason for that was pretty simple. You know, this is a multi-billion dollar company. At that time, we're a startup. And while we were, we had plenty of paying customers and we were making money, we're not $2 billion, right? Or anywhere close to that. So what we didn't want was to say, oh, we'll show you all of our IP and then magically you'll just go, you know, build it yourself instead of buying us. Now we're hosed because, you know, we've opened the kimono and we've got to figure out how to compete with a behemoth or die. So did that answer your question or? Yeah, I no, I, I think there's so <laughs> many synergies, right? So we have this, I, I use this framework called the scalable impact framework. Huh? And I'm looking for three things. I'm looking for leverage sales, bankable profits, and transferable value. If they yeah. hit all three of those things, then I'm going to invest up to half a million dollars, like yeah. a seed round type of investment. Yeah. So I, I feel like you're looking for literally the exact same things, depending you're on gonna what sell, Yeah, if you're going to sell the company, transferable value is what really matters at the end of the day. You can break it down into other pieces of what that means, right? Like, 
it, really you think about it, there's like kind of four types of capital. So structural capital, which means assets that you own and those kind of things, which can be transferred, right? There's that tangible side of it. And then you've got your customers, which is the other piece. Um, human capital, which is your talent that you have. And then there's social capital, right? And social is your brand, you know, your reputation. Um, if you think about it, it's where goodwill goes, right? In a, in a transaction and goodwill being right. Like I take the the market value for your company and I subtract out the liabilities and I subtract out the tangible assets. And then there's this intangible, like your humans that are left. And then anything above that, that I pay that's above fair market value, that's considered goodwill in an acquisition. So that all of that becomes that transferable value, right? Unless somebody does something really dumb and screws the brand, right? Which you can't prevent after you've been acquired, but it doesn't change the price of the company at acquisition. I gotcha. I gotcha. That's interesting. So what, what I've noticed um, based on like revenue levels, right? Like from what I've seen, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but for someone to go from three million a year to ten million a year, it yeah. really comes down to building that foundational leadership team, right? Yeah. But then from ten million to let's say a hundred million, it's about building like transformational leadership systems. What What are your thoughts on that? It's true. Although I think to get from zero to like that. 10 million mark, you do have to have systems in place. It doesn't have to be the same kind of thing, right? That you have to have to get from that 10 to a hundred million or billion or, you know, beyond that, right? Like Cheyenne was bought for a billion and a half, almost a billion and a half when we sold to CA, right? But we were already publicly traded company. We took that company public, we're publicly traded. But that company looked dramatically different at the point of acquisition than it did when we started, right? When we were, you know, in a crappy little office space in, in Roslyn, New York, it did not look the same, right? <laughs> Um, but it's putting those systems in place that will scale. So I think what people miss early on is, and one of the things that we, like what the stuff I do with PowerScript, like part of that is t telling people like, hey, you've got to put these things in place. Or when somebody comes to me and says, oh, I want to sell my company. I'm like, well, great. What do you want to sell it for? So what do you mean? I'm like, well, you got a number in your head. What's the number, right? And some people really do. And other people are like, oh, I, and most people think their company is worth way more than it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, for real, like if you done a basic valuation, right? But I'm like, you need to know what the goal is because how are you going to get to the goal if you don't know what the goal is, right? And how much you want to sell your company for could mean I want a $100 million company because that's my, you know, end all be all. Or it could be like, hey, I know I want this amount of money because I can live the life I want to live, right? If I have that much cash. And I think people miss understanding how much money that is. Like they don't think about all the things they might want to do or not do. What kind of lifestyle do they want to live? How long will that cash last? So figuring out what that is and then backing into it. But the systems that you put in place, it can be simple. Like people don't really think about this. I'm like, I don't care which tool you use. I care that you understand the process and you've put something in place that will you know, allow you to manage as much of that without you having to get in the middle of it. You should be working on the business, not in the business over time. And how do you put those pieces in place? And just think about buying whatever tool you're going to buy to do this that will scale. That's it. It's not, you know, and if you're buying a cloud-based tool, that unless it's got some extraneous limitation on it, you should be fine for doing those things. And you may have to change something like you might've bought a CRM that you have to change into something else, you know, five years later when you're doing $10 million in revenue, not really that big a deal as long as you can, because you should be able to afford to pay somebody to do that work at that point. Yeah. Right. A hundred percent. But if you get the wrong people and the other thing is sometimes the people that start the company aren't the people to finish the company. Boom, dude. <laughs> yes. That is huge. I was at a, I was at this thing. I was I was speaking at a thing on International Women's Day. And there were three women on the panel, and the one woman who went before me, she's like, "Don't ever let anybody come in and run your company." Blah 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 blah. And I was like, and I'm just kind of you know kind of snickering under my breath and waiting, you know. And so they said, "Hey, what do you think about that?" And I said, "Hey, if that's what's right for her, awesome." I said, "But I'm never running another public company again." And they're like, "What?" I'm like, "It's not fun. It's just not fun." And I said, the problem is everything becomes about legal and compliance and all the other stuff. And it's not about running the company. It's not about any of the reasons why you built the company in the first place. And I don't like it. So therefore I don't want to do it. Um, and I said, that's the great thing. 
people have this crazy idea in their head that the CEO always has the most equity and that's just BS. Mm -hmm. You can bring somebody else in. If you're not the right person, you can bring somebody else in to be in that role and you can still own 80% of the company. Who cares? You own 100% of the company if you just want to pay people salaries, right? At the end of the day. So it doesn't have anything to do with ownership or like being on the board and being the chair of the board it has nothing to do with title at, at the end of the day. So I, I find it odd when people, I think people have this power associated with being CEO and realistic. I think it's an ego thing, yes, right? Like, like, but it's not what goes on behind the scenes, right? At the end of the day. And it, it's, it's very interesting to, that people like equate that with somehow being success. Oh, if you don't have that title, I'm like, yeah, whatever, who cares? Right at the end of the day. And somebody asked me, they're like, well, what about this title? What if you were to do this and take this title? I'm like, I don't care about titles anymore. Look, I've been through all that BS. It doesn't matter to me. And I, I said, so titles have nothing to do with power at the end of the day. Well, Mr. Guess for the president of the United States, maybe it does, but most titles have nothing to do with power, right? At the end of the day. Um, and particularly not in, a business, in the normal business world, right? It has to do with who has the most ownership at the end of the day. So to me, I think that, yeah, find the right person. There's, um, I'll give you a good example. There's a guy, Farnham Jahanian is now the president of Carnegie Mellon University. Farnham founded a company called Arbor Networks, which was one of the top tech companies out there. He came up with the idea when he was a professor at the University of Michigan in computer science. He ran the computer science department at UM. He started the company, took a sabbatical from school, started the company, but then realized he wasn't the right company person to run it. Went and raised some capital. They brought in a CEO to run it. A few years later, the CEO ended up leaving. They were looking for a new CEO. This is how I actually met, or met him far at that point in time. And um, it was very interesting because he's like, hey, I'm not the right person. I realized I'm not the right person to run the company. It's not who I am. I was good at starting things, but I'm not good at doing this. And ultimately they had a great exit. They brought another CEO, but sometimes, you know, particularly the tech industry, there's a CEO that does that back of the napkin to, it might be a million bucks, 5 million bucks, whatever it is, maybe 10 million, depends on who they are. Right. But they're that good idea person mm -hmm. right, at the beginning. And you're really good at that, but they're not the best leaders and they're not the best developers of humans that's bro that's the code that's the code you have to crack <laughs> to go to the next level yes and so you have you got to do something that's going to get people to follow you right and you've got to get people in, enthused about why they want to do this why do they want to be on board what what's in it for them besides just a paycheck because that might have worked a decade ago or two decades ago but you're not going to hire a 25 year old today that's doing it just for the paycheck. No. Or probably even a 35 year old for that matter. Maybe even a 45 year old, right? <laughs> because they, they want something else. They want to have a different kind of impact. So you've got to figure out like, how do I create a culture that will help those people thrive and, you know, take them to the next level. And so to get to that next level and beyond, you've got to do that. When you hit about 300 people, then people can be me mediocre. Mm, which right. kills everything it's but it's odd because people can hide inside of companies then you can just kind of show up yeah. and do your job and and it'll be okay i find it if you get that it's not really good companies tend to kind of stagnate a little bit then they may eventually get to where they're going but it'll be a much slower process if you get to the point where you accept that mediocrity and how do you check that? Like in, in companies that you're going to invest in, how do you even go in and like, how can you tell if people are being <laughs> mediocre or not? Well, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be investing in a company that has 300 employees. Uh, so I mean, before then, but there's not really a good way to do it other than you looking at like, Hey, how many people have, um, how much has the company grown over a period of time? Right. Um, and by grown, I mean like revenue growth. I don't, I don't care about how many people you hired. That just means you have enough money in the bank to pay them. Mm -hmm. uh, and more people isn't necessarily better. Mm -hmm. um, I find that you want people who really want to contribute more um, versus hiring more people to make their life easier. It's a different mindset, right? It's like they really want to do something that's going to have impact that they can look back and go, I did that. And empowering them. And if you hire 
to me, it's about hiring the right people. One of the things that I've always done and one of the things I teach the founders to do is we use personality profiles. So mm -hmm. I'm also a disc practitioner, right? I'm Myers-Briggs and all those things. And um, when I was doing this stuff for the university and created their incubator program, I made all the founders take a Myers-Briggs test. And, and they were like, why are we doing this? I said, just take the test. Take the test, come in tomorrow and show me what you got. So not a lot of surprises to me is what was in there, but there's some surprises to them. Like you get a pair of founders, like one's an ENTJ and one's an INTJ, right? That sounds really cool, except for you've got one who is very outgoing, one who's very introverted, but the judging part and the other part, they butt heads. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to figure out how to communicate. And so one of the things I told them, I said, the reason I had you guys do this, and I've written this paper on how different types should communicate. And like, now I want you to take this and go think about not only your co-founder, if you've got a co-founder, but the people you're hiring, right? Like, how do I communicate with them? Because you have to meet them where they are, not where you are. You can't just be a dictator and, you know, put it all out there because you're going to piss off half the people and they're going to walk. Or they're going to stay around and collect a paycheck till they found another job. Either way, it's not good for you as a company. And or then, you're Adam Newman and you fucking have this cult. God, don't even get me started on that idiot. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, oh, that was like the, I just can't even. Like how people were giving this dude money. I'm like, and you want to say something really weird? weird? When, I, when Mark Andreessen gave him money for this new thing, I'm like, dude, are you cracked today? Like, what is going on? Like this guy is truly a nut job. And he walked away with so much money. And I'm thinking like, dude, if he wants to start this, let him take his money and do it. Let's do it, yeah. All that awesome, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> oh, such a mess at the end of the day. But I mean, it's it's those kind of things, right? You just look, some things in the VC world like make my head spin a little bit, but they're not playing with their money. And that's the thing people don't really understand, right? If I'm a venture capitalist, I'm not investing my own money. I'm investing somebody else's money. I'm investing somebody's pension fund most of the time. Mm, yeah. Right. So it's not their cash. And so I, I think Mark Andreessen might have a different viewpoint if he was investing his own money. Just say it. Yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. That's it's so interesting. So um how do you I'm sure you deal with this, but in, how do you deal with founders that like show tendencies of self-sabotage? It's it's hard, right? And being a founder is really lonely. I think this is the thing people don't understand. It's um, most entrepreneurs, actually, if you look at the studies, um, almost 90% have a um, a mental, I won't say illness, but they have a, a challenge. Like a neurodivergency type of thing. So it could be that they're prone to depression. It could be, I mean, you get a lot that have borderline personality disorder, a lot. Right. And it kind of makes sense because there's these polarizing components, right? There's like super highs and there's just really low. And it's like being on a roller coaster. I used to say it's like standing on a razor blade is being a, uh, you know, it's like just one slip and you're dead kind of thing when you're going through this. And I mean, I've dealt with it myself. Like there's like, there's been days you're just like, holy shit. Like, you know, I mean, because you go through things like, how am I going to make payroll tomorrow? I mean, I've went through that. I've gone through a whole bunch of different things because not every day is a pretty day. And um, Brad Feld said to me once, he said he literally couldn't get out of bed for like 30 days. You think about that. Th that dude is, everybody considers him to be a rock star, right? Like he was an entrepreneur, he's a venture capitalist, he's this, it's like, but you know, I think we just don't admit that we struggle with it. So one of the things I tell them, I, I've had a coach, I've worked with the same coach for 23 years um i think having a coach is the best thing any founder could ever do for themselves and the reason being it's somebody you can tell anything to things you can't tell your partner things you can't tell your co-founder right you can tell them your fears you can tell them all the other shit that you're dealing with um because they're there only for you mm -hmm. and only for you know your health and so it's it's really interesting and i do work with a fair number of founders who are in that scenario, right? It's like, yeah, I'll help you with your business, but we can also talk about whatever the other crap is you're dealing with. Because I've dealt with that. My ex um, was not a great partner, meaning he was not, uh, 
he'd be happy to take the money that I brought into the house and spend that money. That was all well and good, you know, no problem with that. But not supportive of me and the things you have to do. And I remember when we were at the end, he's like, I want the person I married. And I'm like, well, dude, like you can't have that person and have this person too, because that's not how this works, right? And now the person I'm with is unbelievably supportive and has been, you know, and for, for years and has encouraged me and understands that, hey, not every day is going to be, you're, you're not going to get my undivided attention every single day. It's not how it works, right? Because you can't be the best partner, the best CEO, you know, the best mom or whatever, every single day, like you can't. Um, and so I think it's about communicating and letting your family know. And so one of the things I work with founders on is like, how do you communicate to the people that you really care about in your life? Like, Hey, I can, I can be this person on this day, but I can't be everything every day. The challenge with a founder, when it comes to dealing with bad situations or things at work, I can't show that all the shit that's going on in the background to the people who work for me because mm. I need them to believe and keep moving forward. Right. That's key. And if you show a kink in the armor, then it's a challenge. And I find um, some people use meditation. I can't meditate. I don't know what the hell's wrong with me. I've tried it. Um, and so some people use that, but I do believe in affirmations and I do believe in, in things like that. So I look at those kind of things and say like, okay, what kind of things are really going to keep me focused? And I tell founders, like, you need to find whatever that is for you. Like it can be I'm a scuba diver. And so one of the things I love to do to kind of do mental reset is I go diving. And the reason for that is I can't focus on anything other than that. Mm. I can't be thinking about what else could be going on. And I'm sure you realize this because one of the challenges we have is a lot of entrepreneurs have ADD and we've got a million different things going on in our head all the time, but I have to shut all that off because if I don't, I die. So it's very interesting how that works at the end of the day. Um, and for some people that may be going to the gym for other people, it might be reading a book. I, I can't tell people what it is for them, but you have to find your thing, whatever that is. Um, preferably not cocaine or, you know, these other things, right? Like there, there some people go the other way. So, you know, there are these other things. It um, happens. <laughs> but I mean, you preferably something that doesn't do self-harm, right? As, as a part of that. But I think if you can find out what your thing is and do that to, and figure out how much time do you need? Like my partner, he needs he needs time every day just to be by himself. And it doesn't have to be a lot of time. It can be like 15 minutes, 30 minutes or whatever. And if he doesn't get it, he's not very much fun to be around. So I recognized that a long time ago. And it was odd. We were at his dad's house one day. And there, you know, we're going to sit and, and he said, oh, I'll go run an errand and do this. And the whole family's there, right? Everybody's going crazy. And his dad said to me, why does he always go do this? I'm like, he's been your son his whole life. Have you not figured this out yet? Like he just needs like that 15, 20 minutes. He's going to go do the air and he'll be back. He's doing what somebody else would have to do anyway. But if you don't give him that, we're not going to have much fun later. Cause he's going to be crabby and it's not going to, it's not going to be good. He just, he's an introvert. Right. And so he kind of needs that little mental reset. The things that take people like me and you and make us like be around a billion different people. And we just get more and more on it's energy depleting for them. Right. And so they kind of have to have that moment to reset. But I think understanding yourself is the key, right? Like we're all different, but that, you know, self-knowledge and being willing to admit, at least internally, I don't care if you admit it to the outside world, I guess, but at least internally what your flaws are and, you know, what you're good and not good at. Like I learned a long time ago, like I hire people who are better at me that shit that I'm not good at you know, and I don't tell them how to do it. Um, I'm not going to, we talk about what the outcome is going to be and that's great. It took me a while to get there though, because, you know, you always want, if you're a perfectionist or you want things done a particular way, you try to kind of say, oh, you should do it this way. But in reality, it doesn't really matter as long as it gets done at the end of the day. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's so interesting. You touched on so many things. So like, um, 
the I do meditate. I'm able to visualize. I'm able to like just and it wasn't easy to get there, right? It was a fucking process. But you're doing the same thing when you're when you're diving, right? Like that's just your form of meditation. Um for me, it was like being able to tap into gratitude and having a heart full of gratitude. So like I jump into the future, right? Lately, my thing has been like envisioning a um me in a hospital room my parents are there uh, my grandparents are there and my girlfriend is there and she's holding two twins and like when I go there dude I'm just like (laughs) tearing up I know gratitude has been hit because I start tearing up and I don't feel any pain so like that's like my north star right now um and then from there I go to like our beach house with a yacht and six kids like it's just you it's this like, thing just like it's driving me dude yeah. and it lights a fire under my ass every single day I'm excited to work on the things that I'm working on cuz I know it's it's like what I'm doing right now that's going to happen as a byproduct guaranteed well, that's the thing. And if, you, if you're if you doing something you truly love and you're enthusiastic about it, that's the thing people don't realize. The money comes after. Like people say, oh, if, it's like entrepreneurship isn't about focusing on the money. It's focusing about doing something you actually want to do. Like, what do you want to do? What contribution do you want to make to the world, right? Of course, we all want to make enough money to take care of ourselves and our family. Like that's logical at the end of the day. We don't want to work for free forever. But if you're only focused on the money, it's going to get in your way. It's not going to help you at the end of the day so yeah, i think there's levels to that thing right because like in in i guess when i look back to me um uh, like my first mill dude that i did in a year like that was driven through pain and suffering and like beating myself and just forced myself there but then when you're there you're like okay i'm here like what's next and it's just like rebuilding a new vision that you want to go towards and like relighting that fire and really having it come from unconditional self-love versus pushing the pain and suffering over and over again. Cause that shit just gets like draining, dude. It's like, how much longer can I just hate myself towards success? (laughs) Well, no, but it's, what's really cool about it is there's, I I talked to somebody the other day, they were talking about how much money people need. And I'm like, well, I don't know how much money do you need? And like, what do you mean? I said, well, I've had more money than I have today and I've had less money than I have today. I said, what I've learned over time is how much money I thought I needed. I don't need that much money. Um, I can live the life I want to live without having that much money. But most entrepreneurs who are successful become philanthropists as well, right? They give money away because they want to see change in the world. And so they decide how they're going to do that. Um, I said, but to me, it's like you want enough money. There's a point when you reach this, this point, you have, have enough money that I can provide for myself and I can provide for my family. And when you reach that point where it's like, I know I've got enough money. I'm not going to have to worry about it. Nobody's going to starve. Nobody's going to be homeless. Nobody's going to do this stuff, right? And when you reach that point, now everything on top of that is gravy. It doesn't mean you want to stop earning. You want to stop doing anything. But you're not worried about the money. You're worried about the mission. There's no more worried about the money. The money just comes. Plus, if you have enough money, you put your money and you invest your money correctly, then your money compounds. And so you make more money any freaking way at the end of the day, right? And so it's, it's those kind of things, but I think people's, there's an attitude shift that happens there to your point, right? Like, oh, it's focusing on the pain, right? Because the pain was the driver at that point in time. Like the back against the wall mentality, because you knew that's where you just fucking worked the best. Right. And you had, you had, you wanted to get to the point where you had that, right? Where like, oh, you know, you and your partner have a, you've got a house, you've got these things, you've got all these other things. So it's like, okay, I'm good now. Like, I don't have to worry that, you know, I can go to Starbucks and spend eight bucks for a coffee. You know, it's not going to matter. Right. So that's the thing. I had a buddy of mine said, he said, how he knew he was rich was when he didn't have to look at prices in the grocery store. Like, oh, that makes sense. Right. You're not, you don't have a budget per se anymore. Right. You know that there's enough money in the bank that you can pay whatever the bill is when you get to the checkout counter. Right. And so I think when we get to whatever that point is for each of us, then everything on top of that, you you flip the switch, right? So now you're focused on, hey, what are the positive things of this? Like, how do I get more positivity? How do I do more of this? How do I, you know, make other people around me happy? How do I do these other things? And it just, it just shifts your, your mentality a little bit. I don't think it makes you work any less hard. I think it just, you know, gives you a little bit of a mental break so that you are not, you don't have that negative 
stuff creeping in as much anymore. Makes you more free thinking, in my opinion. Yeah, it, like for me, it was just flipping the switch on like, like really lighting the fire again. Yeah. Because it was just like draining, dude. Like, fuck, I have to put my back against the wall again? <laughs> like, no, dude, I want to do it out of love because I deserve it. Like, I, I deserve to be my highest self. I really believe we're, that everybody, but specifically entrepreneurs, are are dealing with a daily war. And the daily war is their highest self versus their mediocre self. And, like, through our yeah. actions, we decide who wins. Yeah. That's, I think that's absolutely correct at the end of the day. And I mean, I had the opportunity, right? Like I, I got to work it. I, I find it interesting when people criticize Steve Jobs, they talk about, you know, Jobs is an asshole and stuff. And I'm like, you know, I just disagree with that. So I worked for Guy Kawasaki at Apple. Guy Kawasaki later invested in one of my companies. Um, and that was my, I guess, maybe my first and probably only real job per se. <laughs> um, and, um, but it was pretty cool to get that job right out of school, right? You're like, oh my God, like this is an amazing opportunity. And, and I'm, I'm super grateful that I had it. Um, but I never worked for Steve directly, but I've been in meetings and people are like, God, the guy's such an asshole. You know, when the movie came out and they're like, oh, like what a jackass he was. And I'm like, you know, it never came from a place of malice. And that's what people don't understand is yes. Was he relentless when it came to getting the best product out there? 100%. Um, but part of that came in my, I believe from jobs being adopted and never feeling like he was good enough. Not that his parents made him feel that way or anything, because he would be the first person to say his parents were amazing and, you know, did everything for him. But I think there was this part of him that felt like if people loved his product somehow or another, they also loved him. And I, his decision was like, I want to make something that's going to make a real impact in the world. And, you know, I really want to do something that's going to change the world forever. And I would argue he did accomplish that. Yeah. Um, but he never directed, I never saw him once in screaming and yelling and having fits and everything. He never directed it at an individual. And so I'm like, hey, you know, entrepreneurs are typically volatile people. It's part of who they are. Um, and I never took that personal. Now, some people would freak out and be like, oh my God, like, that's horrible. I don't know. I feel like if you're directing it at another person, that's a problem. But if you're directing it at a problem or you're frustrated, I just kind of overlook that stuff and go, that's part of the deal. Right. Um, I don't want to get political, but I'll say that's the difference between like an Elon Musk and a Donald Trump. Right. One person is directing it at an individual. The other person is directing it at a problem. So both volatile people. Right. <laughs> but directing their their frustrations or things in a different way at the end of the day yeah no for sure great insights um so you've been a, a vocal advocate for diversity in tech like how yeah. do you approach creating more inclusive environments and what changes do you believe are essential in the tech industry to support underserved founders so i think that uh, uh, underserved to me means I guess we can define that term, right? The way when I think about undershirt, I think non-white males, right? So that's mm. <laughs> right at the end of the day. And I don't have anything against white males. Please don't, everybody don't come hate me. I have nothing, <laughs> nothing against them. Okay. Um, but it's like you have you have the whole LGBTQ community, right? You have different ethnicities, you have different genders. Um, and you also have immigrants, right, coming in and out of our country when we think about what happens in, in America. And I feel like if you look at the tech industry as a whole, still the vast majority of the people in our industry are male. Um, the vast majority of the males are also white males. Um, people could look at that and say, well, that's because of, you know, their education or their interests and stuff like that. Sure. There are definitely more people pursuing STEM careers that fit that mold. But we need to look at how do we get more people to pursue STEM careers, first and foremost. So one of the things I've done, I've been a part of multiple groups in the cybersecurity arena that focus on women um, and under other served groups. Um, I have been, I've, I've, I'm an investor in a black venture fund that only invests in black founders. Um, and, you know, it's funny because people are like, well, that's kind of weird for you. I mean, I'm Native American and Irish, right? And I'm like, I don't know. Is it weird? I just, I look at what is happening in the world and I see that this group 
doesn't get their fair share. And so to me, you want to make that change. One of the things we do when we're hiring and one of the things I tell all my clients that I work with that they should do if they really want to support this, you should take 50% of all the applications that you're looking at for a job and make them be from an underserved group. I don't care which one, it doesn't really matter to me, but all things being equal, you should have, if you look at 10 candidates, five should come from that underserved group and five can come from wherever else. But if you're not doing that, then you're not even giving them a fair shot coming in. And if all things are equal, I'll choose the underserved because the underserved doesn't get the same. They're just not as equally represented. And until we make that shift, right, until things like from the boardroom all the way down look like society looks, we're going to have a problem. So I'm a big, I work on the Florida Women on Boards Initiative to get more women on boards in, in the Russell 3000 companies across Florida. Um, we have an initiative like that through the International Women's Forum, which I'm a part of. I I do that in the the other funds that I'm an LP in in Silicon Valley. One of them has uh, probably 50% of the partners are Indian. Um, they have a mantra to um, have a, at least one diverse founder on every single founding team uh, that they go forward. So you have to make a conscious effort, in my opinion, to make a change. And it frustrates me when I see, I was talking to this with Jeff, my partner, about this the other day. And um, I said, you know, I said, what really frustrates me is when people just don't speak up. When things happen, right, I, as I said, I don't look at it unless it's directed at an individual. When you see something directed, you see something bad happen. Um, and by bad, I mean somebody making an insulting remark, saying something under their breath, doing things like this. We see this crap happen all the time or not giving someone a fair shake. You have to speak up and say something. And while you and I can speak up, we're going to get oftentimes snarky remarks because of who we are, you know, because of our gender, because of how we identify, whatever, we're going to get this crap. But if a white male speaks up when another white male does something, that's a whole different ballgame. And so I had a young founder come up to me. I was speaking at an event in Miami and it was a women's event. And so it's very interesting. Like, there were men in the room, but uh, he's probably in his early, early to mid twenties. And he was hired his 10th employee. And he said, Hey, he goes, how do I, I want to make sure we just hired our 10th employee as a woman. It's the first one we ever hired. How do I make sure that, you know, she feels like she can speak up, that she's heard that, you know, um, she's equal to everyone else on the team. And I'm like, do what you just did right now. And he's like, what I said, literally have a team meeting with everybody in the room and say, Hey, we're going to, everybody's equal here. We're going to listen to everyone. Everyone has an equal voice. I said, that's it. Claim it and stick to it. You've got to uphold that. But say it publicly in front of everyone so there's no miscommunication about what the expectation is for all the other employees who are here. And it's those kind of things. It's not it's not rocket science. It's not super complicated. We just have to stake a claim and say, hey, this is what we're doing. And not accept mediocrity, to your point. Yeah, I think Jeff Bezos has an interesting perspective on this. I saw a clip from him and he was like, hey, I don't the most junior person can come and bring something to the table. And as long as data backs it, we're going to move forward with it. Like it doesn't matter, like the hierarchy or anything like that. It's funny. So Charles Wong, who was the CEO, the founder and CEO of CA, who bought um, Cheyenne, our company Cheyenne. Charles had an open door policy in his office. He's running a $6 billion company. And he's like, the door is always open. You can always come in. And people are like, well, that's weird. I'm like, I don't know. I think the guy, like he genuinely wants to know what the hell's going on in his company. And, you know, he doesn't want to be shielded from everything. When he would travel around the world um, to go do site business and stuff, any, any office, any, any city he came into that had an office, <laughs> they would host a breakfast meeting. It was early. Got to get up early, like 6 a.m. Um but he would take like that 90 minutes from like 6 a.m. to like 7, 30, 8 o'clock. And not only would they feed you breakfast, which they fed breakfast at every site anyway, but he it was open Q&A with him. So show up. That's dope. And ask whatever question you want to ask, you know, have whatever conversation you want to have. And I don't see a lot of people doing that and being willing to take that kind of input. But to me, I always had the 
philosophy that I would tell my team, we're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain and no one's more important. The CEO just has a job. The person who's, you know, the janitor has a job. One's not more important. Everybody has to function for the company to work. And if you're running a lean operation, that's absolutely true. And when somebody falls down, then we all have to, you know, look to pick that up. And I think if you foster that mentality, if the seat if from the top down, that's what you see, employees won't last very long if they don't fit into that because other people will call them out. Which is what you want. It's absolutely. You want accountability. <laughs> absolutely. At scale. <laughs> yes. That's interesting. Um, so what what are your thoughts on leveraging nearshore or offshore talent? I said it work. Um, I think it works if you have the right people. And um, I don't like, this is my opinion. This is my opinion. So it's just my opinion. I don't like it when people say, I'm just going to outsource all my development and to some third party, particularly offshore. Um, and we're not going to own anything in-house. I find that really usually doesn't work at scale. Um, it can work to get you a core product. Um, probably the only way I see that work at scale, if you have a really reputable company, people are not like it's because it's expensive, that's primarily US-based, where you're interfacing with someone in the US. And you should calculate that, let's say it costs you $50,000 to have something developed. She says a nice round number. You can figure it's going to cost you 20 to 25% of that to maintain it every year. So this misconception that I'm going to pay for something and then uh, it's just going to work forever. It's not how it works. Uh, it's not how software works. And so you can't do that. Um, I've seen certain companies where they have onshore and offshore inside their operation where we have this. Um, uh, my company, Business Layers, which ultimately got acquired, right? All of our software development was done in Israel. Most of the our employees were Israeli. There were six of us executives. Um, Four Israeli, one Cuban, and me. But our 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 development was done in Israel. We did our QA in the United States, um, and that was very effective. Um, I have uh, another company that I've got brought in to do a turnaround where software development was done in Pakistan. The CTO of the company was Pakistan, and would go back and forth. So again, that worked because you had someone who they respected who spoke the language, who understood the local culture, who's managing that team. I find it breaks down often when you don't have that synergy. Uh, same thing, a buddy of mine who runs a venture fund out of Silicon Valley, um, he's Indian. They have an office in Pune um, that helps this, the companies they invest in augment their de dev teams over there. That seems to have worked pretty effectively, but you've got an intermediary who understands both. I find that it usually doesn't work particularly well unless you're making a lot of trips back and forth um, and understand the culture and understand how to work with them. I could be wrong, but that's- No, uh, you hit it I like perfectly. <laughs> so we we do it more on the sales and marketing side. Um, so we <laughs> leverage a lot of uh, Latin American and African talent in the front end. Latin American, African, Filipino. Yeah, perfect. For that kind of stuff yeah. in the back end we leverage um uh, because it's not like tech stuff it's yeah. like fulfillment like uh client services type of thing yeah. um and that's where like back end we leverage asian talent yeah. but it's it works but i'm here in peru right now my background is not i was like you are not in in, in florida right now because i was like, I was like <laughs> okay <laughs> But it's that it's that like making that commitment to building a culture here, yeah. right? Or else it doesn't fucking work, dude. <laughs> you just like try to delegate it out. It really doesn't fucking work. Well, we used to go back and forth to Israel all the time. So it's funny when people talk about this. So I'm like, okay, like if you, you know, because and I, I definitely don't want to talk get political on this, but I mean all the stuff that's going on right now. But I'm like, you know, it's very different how people have form opinions when you've been somewhere or not. You know, when you've actually seen what that culture is like. And I mean, I've had offices in London. I've had offices in Amsterdam. I've had offices in Paris. And, you know, I have my opinions about which ones are better or worse and all the other things. But you have to make that commitment to go there and meet with those people, understand their culture. And, you know, we have to adapt. One of the craziest things that I ever saw, you've been to Asia, right? To Japan? No, I've never been to Asia. 
So in Japan, um, when you present a business card to someone, you actually turn the card um, where your kind of space is where they can read it and you present it with both hands. Anything else is considered a pretty big faux pas. So I was up at the headquarters of Akamai and I saw this guy, he pulls out his card and hands it to this Japanese. Like, no, 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 no. Right. So one of the first things they tell you when you're going to go back to Japan, they're like, okay, these are basic customs of how you do this. And it's just cultural, but it kind of shows like, oh, you don't understand the culture, right? And so when I, and I went through that pretty early on because we had offices overseas. Um, I was in my 20s when I went through that kind of career training. And so after that point, I made it a point, anytime I'm going to go to a country I haven't been to, to like look up what are the business customs in that country so that I don't put my foot in my mouth, like when being introduced to somebody or meeting somebody. And um, they'll forgive you for not speaking the language. They'll forgive you for a whole lot of other things. But if you really like screw it up, they're not going to be as kind to you. Yeah. And it also shows like character development, right? Like you went out of your way to invest time to understand their culture. Like that's fucking awesome. Yeah. So um, from from establishing your own fund to being a limited partner, what do you look for in potential investments? Like, how do you balance risk and innovation in your investment decisions? Oh, that's interesting. Um, what I really look for, aside from the founders, right? We talked about the, the founders and can they execute? And I don't, you know, there's a difference between a proven founder, somebody who's done it before. That doesn't guarantee success, by the way. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a shining example of that, right? Because I had, my, my first companies were fine and I had a I had massive failure in between, right? <laughs> And uh, ended up in court with my former business partner. It's not fun, uh, you know, going through that. So just because you've done it doesn't mean you can do it. But it's more like, what does the team look like? Um, like, who do they have on their team? Do they have people? If they don't have people, are they open to recommendations for who they should put in those roles? Right. Um, I'm not going to manage your employees for you. That's not my job. Um, I don't want to run your company. It's your company. But... I do believe having people who can execute and who can shore up some of the weaknesses of those founders is really important. Um, just like I would look at if it was my company and I was I was doing it, right? Um, the other thing I would look for is have they figured out what their product market fit is, right? Do they understand who their customer avatar is? And do they know what product market fit is? And that doesn't mean, everybody assumes that means they have a product. They don't have to have a product. Um, we sold our first customer without written, having written a single line of code at Velocity. Like we had a check in hand. Um, so I'm more concerned. Did you go out and talk to customers? Do you understand, um, what they're willing to pay? They, they want your solution, whatever it is that you're offering or your product. What are they willing to pay for it? Right. Somebody giving you an MOU or say that, hey, I'll uh, I'll buy it if you have it, right? If you can build this, those kind of things. Because to me, it's like, if you haven't done that and you don't know, then you're just hoping that whatever it is that you're doing is going to work. Well, you know, unless it's a space I really know super well, um, I'm not going to know that. And then the other thing is I, I learned, I don't do, I tried investing in things that were not tech. I would never do that again. <laughs> Um, it, it's interesting. I, it's not that I don't like the people, but I tell people because I'll get people coming like, Joy, like there's a great investment. I'm like, yeah, it sounds really cool. Uh, it's not for me. I can introduce you to somebody who invests in that space or, hey, have you talked to this person or this person? I'm happy to send those deals across to somebody else, but I'm like, it's not for me. And I said, I don't want to invest somewhere. If it's my money, right? As an LP, they get to do whatever they want, but those are all tech funds anyway. Um, but for me, if I can't add something more than just money, I'm not interested. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Oh my God. So much, so much to touch <laughs> on right there. So like with our partners, we do the exact same thing. Like we're like, dude, you sell before you build. Like we have to identify a urgent, painful problem in the market that your skill sets can actually solve for. And then we teach yeah. process mapping. We're like, dude, you map out wh how, what does it look like from beginning to end on how you're going to solve this painful, urgent problem, yeah. right? And then people are guaranteed to pay 
because it's you're only looking for a painful, urgent problem. <laughs> right. Well, it's also very easy for you to understand. Like, well, okay, if you've done that with one or two or three customers, right? So if you've gone, if you found like, oh, there's you understand who that decision maker is going to be in that company, right? Like, what do they look like? What are, what is the problem that they're going to have? They might have a different title, but what's going to be the problem? So you can now start to narrow down like, oh, this industry is more prone to be accepting of my offering, whether it's a product or a service, right? And it's those kind of things because I want to create my target list of who I'm going after, right? As as customers, I mean, it's kind of like sales 101 at the end of the day. And yeah. I, it's funny, I talk to people too, like the other thing we do, it's like, hey, what's your lead to cash? And they're like, I have people like, people like, what does that mean? I'm like, okay, well, now we have a problem. Because if you don't understand what happens from the first time you talk to a customer until they write you a check, we have a big problem. So that is your lead to cash. I talked to a person that gave me money. And it's those steps, right? And that's how you build out your systems, right? It's not super complicated, but it's like, I need to map that whole thing. And then I can start at the high level. And then I put all those little sub steps into it, right? And then that's how we decide what kind of systems get put in place. Again, it's not rocket science, but I think a lot of people are lazy. Lazy, their ego, entitlement. They don't, they're like, no, I want to build this thing. I'm like, dude, nobody gives a fuck what you want to build. They want their problems solved. There are so many things I see now. And I mean, I, I know you guys see this too. Like, I'll get somebody like, I've created this wonderful thing. And I'm like, you know, there's like 85 of those already, right? <laughs> and I'm like, do you know how to use, I, I say sometimes to people, and I know it's really insulting, but sometimes I go like, do you know how to use Google? I mean, like, come on. <laughs> and because somebody says, oh, no, mine's different. I'm like, oh, okay, sure. Um, you know, because I'm like, you're not going to get there. You've got to have something that is unique. What is your unique value proposition? What is it? And so, sure, you could have done, you could have carved out a niche inside a niche inside a niche inside a niche. If it's big enough, cool. Right? Like, there's a guy here in town, him and his wife have like 12 equine podcasts. 12. Whoa. And somebody was like, I'm like, really like there's that many but there are and so he was talking about he's like they make so much they, they print money and it's like but it's because it's like they've got one for dressage like people who take their horses do that right so all these different all these different horse things but i was like well that's genius right like you guys kind of own that market cool and most people have never thought like oh you could do 12 different podcasts in that space but what's cool for them is they get advertisers will cross across all different podcasts so you, mm. you know you kind of think about it, it's like it's almost like they have created their own syndicate right so it's different angles yes in that one vertical yeah okay, like you find therapy you. you know like show horses right like you know and they've got like all these different things so i was like oh okay you know yeah it's a syndicate cool. i gotcha yeah and i mean so i was like hey that's really smart right like you found one thing you explain you're like oh there's a need for all this other great let me let me replicate that. And, you know, so for them, because they've been in that industry for a long time, it was very easy for them to know how to get to the customer. But I was like, hey, that's genius. It's something most people would never think of focusing on, right? At the end of the day. Yeah. So it's, it's those kind of things, just carving out what your thing is. And like, I hear people like, I'm going to start a social media marketing agency. I'm like, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> I'm like... You know, and I'm like, okay, but what are you going to do that's different? So if you tell, if, uh, granted, there's a whole lot of crap out there, but there are some that are really, really good, right? But you've got to figure out, like, hey, who am I appealing to? Am I going after, I'm only going to focus on, I don't know, plastic surgeons, right? Who do facial plastic surgery or this kind of thing. Because you know what, in that, you could have their buyer persona down to, you know, the nth degree. And you could actually walk in and say, hey, I can really provide you something of value. But if you said there's going to be another social media marketing agency, I would argue anybody can go get a tool off the internet. And beat you. You can use Canva and do probably what you're going to do at the end of the day. And they can hire a 15-year-old that they paid, you know, 100 bucks a week to do that. Or leverage global talent at $3 an hour. <laughs> right. It's just... It, it just kind of does it make sense, right? Because there's plenty of good talent out there to do basic stuff like that. Oh, I sent you my brand book and you go do this. Cool. Um, at the end of the day. So it, it really is finding that unique piece. And I feel like people don't spend much, nearly as much time focusing on that. They think they have a great idea and they're just like, I'm just going to run with it. And they don't understand why it fails. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I'm a, uh, I mean, you know, Peter Thiel, right? Like the zero to one model, yeah. like being the monopoly. I'm a real big believer. If like, if you know exactly who your avatar is, how can you solve more problems for them so that there is no such thing as competition? Exactly. Exactly. Like, that's the I, game I want to play. Well, and that's what, you know, we, we were talking with, in the, the Facebook post, right? We were talking about M&A. That's one of the biggest things for is vertical integration, right? So if you can find this one, you know, when you look at a strategic acquisition, that would be one of the things you're looking for is how do I find another product that I can sell to my existing customer base or another service? Um, and I would say for tech companies, that's there's two reasons tech companies buy other people. Um, they buy them for vertical integration or they buy them to take them out of the market to eliminate competition. Very rare they buy them for some other reason, right? Like unusual they would buy them to expand into a new market or anything like that because they can do that without that. And so why spend the money right at the end of the day? But 70 to 90% of all acquisitions fail, which is pretty crazy when you think about that it. That's pretty insane, yeah. And yep. why do you think that is? Because people don't do their due diligence up front or they buy for the wrong reason. Yeah. It's It's weird. It's like, so I created a process that we use at CA and we had to get so much market share or get so much revenue in a period of time. It had to be complementary to our existing product set. There wasn't any overlap, but it's funny when, um, when CA bought us, they, um, they shelved two of our products. They won. We had four products, four main products. And there were like subsets of those products. We had the global market share for, um, back up in disaster recovery, 80%. And we had 65% uh, of all the antivirus um, market in the world when they bought us. But we had a network monitoring tool that's the equivalent of like HP OpenView. They shelved that. They're like, nope, we're not going to do that because we believe that competes with our product. And I'm like, uh, pretty sure it doesn't, but okay, cool. Um, but they did. So that's it. We're done. And we had a product that was a fax product way back then, right? But it has something unique. We had already created a way to turn text to audio and deliver that in an audio format. And they're like, this has no value. Nobody's ever going to use this. <laughs> yeah. So they just canned it. It's like, it was like, so you get weird stuff like that. And then you have things where they came in and want to change the pricing model. Well, they were pricing their stuff that sit on mainframes and other places. And we were a server-based company, right? Like 90% of the market is today. And we were like, this is not going to work. They didn't listen. They lost a bunch of market share. Then they, then they finally listened. And I'm like, well, you're not going to get all those people back now that you listened. I mean, like, we'll get part of them back. You're not going to get them all back again because they've gone somewhere else and you piss them off, right? So customers tend to not like want to hang out with people who piss them off uh, okay. at the end of the day. So it's, it's weird stuff like that, right? When you think about it. And I think the other part is they, they don't think about what it's gonna, what the sales cycle is. So the other thing that happened, we, we had a situation and Akamai ultimately did make it work with what if they bought us. Um, we kept telling them our sales process of how we did this, what the cycle was. And they're like, no, you're wrong. This is how we do things. And I'm like, I don't know how we're wrong. We've been, we, we're, we did, we created this. Like we're the only ones who do this. And so we created it. And we literally, we were the first mobile content delivery network. And so um, they wouldn't listen. They bought us in June. We closed in June. And um, by October, we had outstripped their ability to sell. The, the, the demand had outstripped it because they wouldn't listen to us about what they needed to have and how they could do things. And they, they thought they could send 80% of it offshore and make this work and it didn't work. And we're just like that customer will tolerate it because it's a high touch thing. They're willing to pay more, but they won't do this. You don't understand like people like Bose are not okay with, you know, you sending them off to some third world country. They're, they're not okay with that. Um, their CMO is not going to do that. And uh, so what was interesting is um, good for me, I, I guess, because I help finish doing all their training and stuff. I had agreed I would stay until the end of December. So in, uh, at the end of October, I called my then boss and I said, Hey, um, can I just take the month of December off? And he's like, what? And I'm like, well, we've done everything you've asked us to do. You can't sell anymore. You've already told people they're not gonna be able to buy anything else until next March. 
because you wouldn't listen to us. And um, I'm just sitting at my house. We've already closed the other office in Florida and I'm hanging out staring at four walls. I'd rather go diving. And uh, and so finally he agreed because I told myself, I'll take my laptop. I'll check mail, you know, once in the morning, once in the evening, but I'm not getting mails because nobody can do anything. And so I took the whole month of December. I rented a villa in Curacao and went diving every day. And when I got back, because when I come back, I'll fly up to Boston. I'll bring you my laptop. Well, you know, all this stuff, which is what I did. And um, they're like, wow. So I invited my family down. I rented a three-bedroom villa. And I'm like, hey, whoever wants to come and stay for a week, come on down. And um, we had a great time. But the problem was they just weren't listening about what, what the requirements were. And I felt kind of bad. I felt bad for my customers. This is who you feel bad for, right? When you're the person selling, because you've built these relationships with these amazing people who have been very loyal to, you know, for us being a startup and working through all this other stuff. And we had big household name clients like Starbucks and Bose, Darden Restaurant Group, Carnival Cruise Lines, right? Office Depot. These people were our, our clients and you feel bad because they trusted you. But the problem is once you are no longer the owner, you don't get to make any of those decisions. And you're like, I'm really sorry. I think if you'll just be patient with them, it'll work out, right? But when you start talking, in this case, companies that are spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars for a product, they're not really okay with waiting. Mm. And so it was it was really disappointing. But Akamai is a good company, so I'm not pooping anything with them. They're, they were great. Our acquisition was great. They're lovely people. I think they just believe they can do something that they couldn't do. And that's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. It is what it is. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, with with your expertise in cybersecurity, what emerging threats should businesses be most aware of? Like how, how can companies better prepare for cyber breaches and really enhance their data privacy? So um I'm a CIPP, so I'm a privacy expert too. Um I think most startups don't really know what the law and regulations around this are. So making themselves aware of what's required, first and foremost, it used to be, even like if you take credit cards, right, that you could kind of hand that off and say, oh, my credit card processor, like a Stripe or Square or whatever, right? They're compliant. It's not allowed anymore. So the implementation has to be compliant. So you can't just pass the buck to somebody else anymore, which is a pretty big deal. Most breaches occur one of two ways. Um, they occur from an insider threat. So it's one of your employees that did something stupid or malicious, one or the other. Um, or they occur through a third-party vendor that accesses your system. So think about how interconnected everything is today, right? And so we've got this supplier, this person, right? And they all connect with our systems to do things. That's the that's the second most common threat. The insider threat is the first most common. Um, and it's usually not intentional, but phishing has gotten much more sophisticated. And if you want to talk about what people should be afraid of, they should be afraid of AI as it relates to cyber. Um, I'm not I'm not some fear monger. AI can do some amazing things. And AI has been around for a long time. Everybody thinks it's like something that happened yesterday. It's not. Um, GPTs are new, right? Those are newer. And they made it accessible to everyone. And that's all well and good. But if you're not kind of, policing your department, you have no idea what your employees are doing with company data and where they're putting it and what's happening. Um, intellectual property theft is going to be a big deal, but AI has made it much easier to do deep fakes. It's made it much easier to do very sophisticated phishing attacks, things that look, sound exactly like someone, right? Like we're seeing attacks where somebody's sending videos that look like the CEO of a company or audio recordings that they piece together from where somebody's out speaking. And, you know, I can feed it samples of my voice, your voice, those kind of things. And now I can go create a voice message that sounds just like us. With spoofing techniques, I can make it appear as if that message came from a different location, right? So it's just gotten a lot more complicated. Anytime our digital landscape increases, so does the threat, right? And so I would say people educating their employees, um, putting some systems in place to police who has access to their network, 
two-factor authentication. I'm so amazed at how many people don't even use two-factor authentication, which is dumb, right? Um, like this latest breach, like we were the the healthcare breach. We didn't use two-factor authentication. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? You guys are a, a health privacy company. Like you're a healthcare provider. What do you mean you didn't use two-factor authentication? Like it's not like that's some magical trick that's been it's been around for a long time. So it's it's those kind of basic things, right? That people aren't putting in place. So I think you know doing those kind of things, it doesn't have to be complicated. People are under the impression that you know policies or procedures, those kind of things, have to be super complicated. They don't. You could even put out something where um, we did this with one of our our clients years ago. So I had another company that we sold that was a cybersecurity consulting company. And uh, we had a big athletic wear retailer that was a client. And they said, well, we can't do um, education. Computer security awareness training is a part of this. It's, it's against our culture. I'm like, well, people want to buy a $150 pair of yoga pants and you can't take credit cards. That's going to be a problem. And uh, so I said, look, you have a you have a briefing in your store every morning, right? Like your manager does a briefing. They do it in every retail store, right? And they're like, yeah. I said, fine. Just give one tip for things that they should practice that day. You just add it as one minute into your morning spiel. I said, don't try to give them a book to read because they won't retain half of it. Like that's not gonna that's not gonna be helpful. People have to hear something nine times to remember it. Mm -hmm. So come up with something that's basically like, hey, you know, check the terminals for you know tampering this morning. Oh, done. Okay, cool, great. Right. So it doesn't have to be really complicated, but it's just kind of coming up with something that will work for their company culture, because I don't want to change the culture. Right. I, I don't want to do that. But I want to make people aware so that they understand what to look for at the end of the day. So I think most employees are conscientious if you give them the opportunity to be. Yeah, for sure. I agree. And and looking forward, like what what technologies or trends excite you the most? Like how how do you see these shaping the future of business and, and consumer behavior? So I think there's a couple of things that will change. I think augmented reality is going to take a little while longer than we think it is because it's not nearly as good as we think it is, to be honest. <laughs> but eventually it will, because I can use location-based services. Think about it in a transiting a city or an airport or a retail store, right? If I can have a pair of glasses that I'm wearing be geolocation aware and can give me information back and forth and I can ask a question to get a response about, oh, where do I find this? Or how do I navigate my way through Frankfurt Airport, right? Which is all in German and no English, right? It's like, how do I get from where I want to go to where I want to go? Those are things that are really helpful to people um, I don't view those kind of things like some people, like, oh, that's an invasion of privacy. I'm like, okay, dude, like, come on. You know, that's silly at the end of the day. Um, I don't view, if you're outside of your four walls that you control, you have no privacy. Just get deal with it. That's the way it is. And that's the world we live in. And it doesn't matter where we are. Just accept that as fact. That if you do something outside of your home, right, there's probably someone watching, someone filming, someone this, right? There's, it's just part of it. So, I don't view any of those things as being threatening per se, any more than walking across the street is going to be. Um, so I think that those things are are part of it. I think that um, AI is going to change everything um, at the end of the day. And I don't think that has to be bad. I think we have to, we meaning we as companies, we meaning we as the government and our government um, I can't believe it. So our government doesn't know what to do, um, to be honest, right? The challenge is we have these people who we've elected and we put into offices in Washington who don't understand anything about technology. And so we're asking them to decide how we should adopt AI, like what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed, but yet they have no knowledge for that basis, right? If you ask me what would be the smartest thing we could do is whoever is going to be sitting in the White House uh, going forward, they need to come up with a, they need to have a, a technology committee that they create that's made up of experts from the field that can give them some guidance on what is and isn't possible, what is and isn't a potential threat, how would be the logical use for data, how do we manage data privacy, what kind of control should be put in place. Um, 
because we're going to have, as, as I said, more deep fakes, more all these other things. We're just going to end up in lawsuits. Imagine trying to prove yourself innocent, right? In a scenario where somebody's created a deep fake video. And so now you've got to go through all this digital forensics gyrations to get through that. A digital forensics person is about $650 an hour. That's what you pay for them. It was a very pricey endeavor. And they have to go back and trace through all these things, right? And then you've got to absorb all these costs to get to the point of proving yourself in court. So not only do we need to figure out like what we are and aren't going to allow, but you're going to have to give law enforcement and all these other people different tools to use that they've never had before. And we need to really think about what that needs to be now and start planning for that. What is the budget that goes along with that going forward? Because it can't just be the wild, wild west indefinitely, because if it does, we're going to all get screwed in the process. But on the converse side of that, if we leverage AI and what it can do, we can do amazing things in medicine. We can do amazing things in you know productivity for people, manufacturing. There's all kinds of stuff that we can do. Even think about finance, right? Basic vetting of applications and things like that against common price. All of that can be automated. So there's things that we can do that can be highly productive and I think the last part of that is we need to look at our education system because realistically, we need to start educating people differently and preparing them for where they need to go. And that should be universal. It shouldn't be like, oh, the kid who's going to private school gets that education and, you know, the kid who's in Compton doesn't get that education because it's not fair. And aptitude and intelligence have nothing to do with where you happen to be going to school. So I, I think we have to start looking at how do we change our school curriculum from a very early age? Because kids, like now, like it used to be that kids didn't get to access technology until they got older. How many five-year-olds do you know who have a phone now? Bro, less than five, dude. Everybody's got an iPad. <laughs> right. An iPad, iPhone. So it's like both my, my niece and nephew, both of them have iPads and iPhones. I'm just like, okay. you know, But they got their iPads early. <laughs> they got their iPads when they were like three, right? But by the time they were in school, they got an iPhone because they couldn't take their iPad to school, but mom and dad want to be able to locate them, right? So there's two sides of it. Now, the kids don't care that mom and dad want to be able to locate them. They care that they got a phone that they can play with, right? At the end of the day. But the thing about it is they're never going to know anything other than that, right? Everything is digital. Anything I want is at my fingertips. And so to me, we need to educate them on how do you get jobs in that space? What do you do? It's not the traditional education that we had before, where we're going with robotics, with all these other things, right? It's going to require people to understand how to manage that technology. How do we create a strategy and how do we manage the technology? Because even low-level coding is going to kind of disappear. Let's be real. Yeah. Because I can do basic things and I can create, you know, I can create prompts. I can create algorithms to do those things. And there's no reason for me to have to do all of that work. I need somebody to proof it once it's done. I need somebody to do, you know, Q&A testing, those kind of things. But a lot of that stuff can be automated. Even like cybersecurity, right? If you think about like the scans that are now run um, by a human, because they kick them off, it's still an automated thing. Why would I need a human to do that? I just simply set up and say, hey, I want to, I want to test this once a week on Saturday at, you know, 1 a.m. There's no reason to have to have a human intervene with that. The The report shows up in your inbox the next day. Cause you just yeah, a hundred percent. We, we moved over all our hosting to hostinger just because of that feature, like the, the malware report thing. And it's just automated. I get a fucking report. Like why yeah. not? And so I mean, I think it's, it's those kind of things, but I do believe this, this is going to be, this is going to be like the internet and the iPhone. So people are like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, nope, nope, it's not going away. Somebody said, oh, it's going to be like crypto. I'm like, nope, I'm not going to be like crypto. No, dude. <laughs> and eventually there will be, there will be a cryptocurrency for sure. Are we there yet? No, not for any kind of standard, but that has to do with a lot with processing versus functionality. Um, and it has to do with, I don't even know how to say this, but there's but people are going to have to expire. There's gonna be some people that have to expire before we get there, right? But it will happen at some point in the future. 
it needs to be universally acceptable and it needs to be uh taxable because our governments won't allow it until it's taxable yeah facts facts and throughout your impressive career how have you managed personal growth alongside professional achievements like what practices or mindsets have been the key to your success um you know it's funny as an entrepreneur particularly the tech industry nothing's ever completed you know so you there's always something left to do um you know there's a new line of there's a new thing so what I learned is if I do things that are for me, um, like scuba diving, like riding motorcycles, like doing other things, right? Um, even weird things like people, it's just so crazy. Our neighbors used to laugh because we did, we cleaned our own pool and we mowed our own grass. Our neighbors were like, what the hell's wrong with you people? Right. <laughs> and, um, but I think part of it was we're both entrepreneurs. And I think part of it was there's a sense of accomplishment when you finish something, right? Like you can say like, oh, I'm done. And it's finished because like building software is never finished ever. And so I like to be able to do those kind of things. I think the other thing is for me, family matters a lot. Um, you know, Jeff has a big family. Um, I don't have a big family. I have a brother and I have a son. Um, but I love spending time with my family and doing things with them. And so it's like allocating time to do things with the people you actually care about because you're never going to get that time back. And if you don't do that, when do you look up and go like, oh, crap, you know, I said I didn't have time to do this, right? It's like the uh, the Cat Stevens song, right? So <laughs> at the end of the day, when and you'd be like, oh, crap, this is, this is really a shitty life. And I think that's what makes people regretful, if you want to be honest. I think it's like they realize they had an opportunity and then didn't do something. And now they look back at it with regret. Well, I decided I don't, I don't want to do that. So to me, it's like, doing those kind of things, taking on a new skill, like going and taking a sushi making class, right? Or doing things like everybody finds things that are that are therapeutic, but it is like doing things like that or I've taken photography classes and um, I read a lot. So not everybody reads a lot. So I read a lot. I like to read. I listen to podcasts all the time, right? So um, I think it's those kind of things because I want to be a better human. Um, I aspire to be the, the, the human my son is because he's a better human than me. Um, at the end of the day and uh yeah he and his wife just got an award for building x number of habitat for humanity houses and stuff so it's like he's a awesome. um he's an entrepreneur too so he travels a lot and does stuff he builds race cars for a living though so i don't do that <laughs> um but i think it is those kind of things about saying hey i have to make time to do things that help me evolve as a person not just my business because so many entrepreneurs, your business is who you are. And it's very hard not to have, not to identify with that because that's how people see you, right? That's how the outside world sees you. And so you really kind of have to make it a point to say, oh, I'm more than just my company at the end of the day. Um, and I don't know, that's not always easy. I'm not sure I necessarily was as good at that in the beginning. And now I get things like somebody emailed me the other day, like, oh, Joy, you realize you've been nominated for this award? I'm like, I don't care. And they're like, what? I'm like, I'm like, I feel like I'm saying that to be snarky, right? But I'm like, what's that going to do for me? Right? At, at the end of the day. Like this last thing with TBBW, that was cool because I love Bridget and she's such a huge supporter of women. So it's like, that's great because I would do anything I can to support her because of what I've seen her do for other women. But I'm like, okay, like it's another thing. All right, cool. If you told me I won like, shit, I don't know, uh, Global Entrepreneur of the Year. Okay, maybe I would be like, wow, that's really cool, right? At the end of the day. But I mean, awards at the end of the day, is anybody ever going to go like, oh my God, like this person won all these awards when you're dead? Who's going to care? Nobody's going to care. There'll be a, a box of stuff somebody has to pack up and get rid of, right? <laughs> at the end of the day. And so to me, it's like, I would say my greatest achievement ever um, from a business perspective is I have 60 people who worked for me in the past who are now CEOs of their own companies. And so the fact that I helped 60 people be the best they could be to go do that, that is the accomplishment at the end of the day. It's not all the other stuff. Um, and it's amazing. I mean, I've hired people to come to work for me two and three times at different companies. And the fact that they'll be willing to come back to me, that's more important to me than the other stuff that's out there. So I don't know. 
Yeah, no, that's beautiful, dude. That's so beautiful. Um, I think it's really important on what you touched on that, like, uh, our, our business becomes who we are. And I, I find it with so many uh, entrepreneurs that are actually like operators, like they came from like a COO operations type of mentality, and they finally believed themselves enough to start their own business. And they have a hard time, like, letting go <laughs> and going out and doing something else. And I'm just like, dude, you deserve it. Like you need to cut the feedback loop is no longer from you being in it, dude. It's now you're a visionary. You've stepped into this role of visionary. Like you deserve to become that person as well. Like there's yeah. nothing more you need to prove to yourself, dude. Like you got it. <laughs> it's interesting. I think one of the things so if, they've, if they've done their business for a long time, they feel like if they sell that company that somehow or another, you know, that means they have less value. And one of the things we work on when we do like exit planning, just because I, part of what I do with a lot of the founders who want to know they want to exit, I've got a client working with now. He's like, I've got this goal and I want to do this over five years. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, is planning for what that's going to be like. Like, what do you want to do with your time after you sell this company? What do you, what does that look like for you? Some people are happy just to go like hang out and do nothing, right? Like that's, that's cool. Um, most founders who aren't 65 years old are not okay with that. Um, and even now some who are that old are not okay with that, right? They want to go do something else, whatever that something else is. And I'm like, okay, you know, you could have a foundation. You could go start another company. Maybe you want to do a company that's just not as big as the other one. You know, you want to have, be able to manage your time better. Right. Or maybe you want to, you know, go teach. I don't know. Like you have to decide what it is that you want to do. Maybe you want to serve on boards and, and that's your goal, but they usually all want to do something that's going to have an impact. There are very few who just say, I'm just going to check out and that's it. It's over for me. Um, start a podcast, help somebody else. I don't care. Like, cause you know, you're not going to need the money, right? So mm -hmm. it's not about the money. Eventually, if you do it and you really care about something, there will be money, but you're not doing it for the money. So there's a ton of different ways that people can do things to, to give back, to have that sense of self-worth that they didn't have before. I find a lot of them don't, think about it you know that's the other thing like people you will exit your company one way or the other whether you want to or not because you're either gonna the company will fail you'll sell it or you're gonna die so one of those things is going to happen um it would be much better if you try to build the highest value you can in your business so you get the optimal exit for that business and then take that money to you know go build something else i'd be willing to bet you money you have somewhere digitally or on paper a whole list of ideas of things that you want to do oh for sure yeah almost every entrepreneur i've ever talked to has that right they've got all these other things that they've thought about doing but they don't have time because they're building the business they're building today right take one of those go do that right like what's to say that you can't have even more success the second time around or the third or fourth or fifth time you know, whatever works for you um, at the end of the day. But I think it's that thing that prevents people. It's that fear of, oh my God, what if I fail the next time? I did really well this time. What if I fail? Failure's just, it's just education. Yeah. hundred percent. It's beautiful. Yeah. All right. My final question to you. Okay. What advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs who want to make an impact in the tech world? Like what, what are common pitfalls that they should avoid? Trust, but verify first and foremost. Um, and when I say that, I mean like not just technology, not just those kind of things, but like the people you're going to go into business with. Because the worst mistake I ever made in my life was, um, I had somebody who I respected very much suggest to me to meet with a person who I ended up being a business partner with. Now, this person is well-known, the, per the, the person who made the recommendation. I trust and respect the guy. He's a good person. He had no idea that the guy that he was referring me to was a scumbag. And the guy looked good on paper. So here's the thing, right? And I this wasn't my first rodeo. The guy had been, had a centerfold in Florida Trend Magazine. The guy had on paper, had exited two companies before and was starting this third one. The technology was solid. 
um, patents, stuff like that. So the tech was was good. But when push came to shove, did some unusual things um, later that ended up not going well. And I would, if I'd done further investigation in the beginning, I would have uncovered some things that would have led me to go, oh, maybe this is not the right place for me to go hang out. So to me, that's really important if you're going to bring on someone. Um, the other thing I see people doing is they don't put the right legal structure in place in the beginning. They want to skimp and save money. And I'm, I don't have money for a lawyer or this or that. If you have any IP worth protecting, you're going to have to spend a little bit of money. Not a lot. You don't have to pay a ton of money on things. I would argue you can file your own trademarks and copyrights and things like that. You don't need to pay somebody else to do that work. But a good trade secret policy, if you have something that can be protected that way, um, that you're going to have to spend money for. If you think you're going to have a patent, you're going to have to pay money for um, an attorney to, to deal with that. You should get a really good IP attorney who has, my question to them would be, how many patents have been challenged and how many of them were defensible? Right? Because just because you can write good patents, if they don't hold up in a court of law, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Mm. Um, and I think the other piece is if you're doing a services business, get errors and omissions insurance, because if you have anything at all to protect, even personally, you need something like that. And it's relatively cheap. We're talking a few hundred bucks a year. We're not talking a ton of money. Um, but you need to do something to protect that so they can't come after your personal assets. Or if you're married, um, your partner's assets, right? So it's those kind of like basic things that are there. The other part is like, I think what we talked about earlier is go talk to the customer. If you think you got a great idea, go talk to a customer and see if they'll give you money for it and how much money they'll give you for it. How big is the pain point? What would happen if they did nothing? So they say, oh yeah, I love it. It's great, blah, blah, blah. Well, what happens if you don't do anything? What are, what are the consequences, right? Because if there are no consequences, then it's still nice to have. It's not a need to have. And it doesn't mean you can't sell it, but it's a lot harder. It's like, if you find that sticking point, and a lot of times people can come up with companies just by going and asking that. There was a company, um, the guy saw a company called SailPoint now uh, out in Austin, Texas. They had a, this is their third company. The guys are all ex-IBMers. This is their third company. These guys have done it three times and they just went and talked to their customers and said, what's the biggest need you have? And what do you think that that's going to impact in your business, you know, three to five years down the road? And they went and built that. They had built-in customers from the very first minute. They're all good because everyone, they let these people be their beta testers. They had them. They basically said, we'll give you the beta product to test and then we'll sell it to you to reduce cost in exchange for you being, you know, an endorser of our product. It's brilliant. And they got like household names to do this. Um, so immediately that makes it super easy for them to go raise money because they're like, oh, look at who I have. Well, great. We'll give you $25 million because of who your customers are. So it kind of eliminates a lot of those other problems by them doing that pre-work upfront. So to me, it's those kind of things, knowing that somebody's really going to want what it is you're building. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for making the time to have this, this amazing conversation. Guys, today's conversation with Joy has been nothing short of enlightening from her early start in entrepreneurship to her significant contributions to the tech and venture capital landscapes. Joy's journey is a testament to the power of vision, resilience, and unwavering commitment to making a difference. Her insights into cybersecurity, mentorships, and fostering diversity in tech have not only illuminated the challenges, but also the immense opportunities ahead. And as we close out this episode, we are reminded that the path to innovation and leadership is paved with continuous learning, bold actions, and the courage to break barriers. Thank you again, Joy, for sharing your incredible incredible story with us to our listeners viewers just keep pushing the boundaries and remember the future is what we choose to make it until next time stay curious and stay inspired awesome thank you laura <laughs>